You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Anya Shortland of King's College, London. Anya, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, thank, thanks for being on. Um, so our topic today is your book. It's called Kidnap, and it's about the economics of the kidnapping industry. So uh, I think most people are not <laughs> very uh, aware of this industry. You know, it's kind of something dramatic that happens in movies. But uh, uh, of course, it's also, you know, it's something that commonly <laughs> occurs in re- real life as well. And there's a whole um, I think the surprising thing in your book is just how organized it all is. So, so tell me, how, how did you get interested in researching this subject? Well, I'm an economist, and I'm interested in tricky trades. I'm interested in how people trade in environments where there is no state or where they have to trade uh, without any formal enforcement processes or where they have to trade under the radar of the law. So uh, trading in hostages, I think, is a particularly interesting case because just absolutely everything <laughs> that, uh, that can go wrong with a trade relationship is a part of this particular exchange. And um, as you said, surprisingly, particularly if you're insured for kidnap for ransom, it almost always works out well. So I was just intrigued to find out how this could possibly be, how the trickiest trade in the world can be so well ordered and so well governed that 97.5% of insured hostages uh, come back, even though it's a, it's a one-off trade with a counterparty that you've not chosen to interact with, um, you have no reason to trust, and um, where there's no payments process, where there is no obvious way of pricing the goods, the hostages. And yeah, where opportunism is just absolutely rife, and yet it goes, it ends well almost all of the time. I find that fascinating. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of shocking, uh, you know, the... Uh... In the movies, the hostages often don't make it, or they they only make it uh, because of you know violence, because uh, they're usually action movies that involve kidnapping. But it's it's amazing just how how often these things are just quietly resolved and money is exchanged somehow. Um, you talk in your book about how um, difficult it is to give money. Yes, and interestingly, not not very much money either. Yeah, so so that that was the other thing that I found very intriguing. So you're right; we do have an idea of how kidnap for ransom works from the media, or rather, how it doesn't work and how it almost always goes wrong. However, that is a very strong media bias for telling the stories that went wrong, and. The kidnaps that I'm interested in are very, very discreetly resolved. And um, well, people don't want to go to the media and say, I paid 30000 or 150000 for my loved one, because that sends a very bad signal to every other criminal in the community that you've got that kind of money kicking around. And also the media not, are not really interested in stories where nothing really happened. <laughs> Everything was discreetly resolved after few days or a week or even just an afternoon of prevaricating so um you you uh you sort of uh one of the early chapters of your book leads with a story from a colombian businessman who um you know he was uh transporting some goods uh in a in an area controlled by uh, farc uh, farc um well can can you explain you know like what is FARC and, and then that, that anecdote, because it's interesting and it sort of illustrates, you know, the, uh, the way these trades often work. Yeah, so that was a really interesting story, a real eye-opener for me. So this was a Colombian businessman who needed to bring some goods, some investment goods, into a town that was controlled by uh, a rebel group. And uh, he was aware that if he wanted to do that, there would be 
some charge <laughs> at a roadblock, and he was trying to circumvent that charge at the roadblock. So he came up with this ruse of hiding the goods on a float, putting a band on top, and then sending it along with the procession in honour of the Virgin Mary. He was really pleased with this idea, and the goods got into town absolutely fine, but his friend didn't make it. So rather than paying at the roadblock, he was now in a situation where he had to ransom his friend from the fuck. So he, he dashed off into the jungle, <laughs> I uh, was led to the uh, the, the, the fart camp and uh, was told that, uh, yes, they did have his friend, but he would now have to make um, a deal over the fine that he would have to pay with the accountant. So off he goes into this tent and um, there is a man with two computers and a database and he said, he knew everything about my company. And he said, okay, um, well, you would have paid 2000 at the roadblock, but now it will be 10000 And it was a very well-judged fine, and that it still made it just about worthwhile to continue the business in the town. And he agreed that that's what was going to happen. And um, he drove straight out with his friend. And then a few days later, he paid the fine, and even his friend's car was returned at the end of this transaction. So I thought, well, yes, here we have a kidnap for ransom story in one way, but actually it's also a different story. It's a protection story. It's about a rebel group taxing effectively economic activity and business within its territory. So as I was researching my book, I thought, well, if I know that there is somebody who poses a kidnap threat, then in equilibrium, I'd rather pay him not to kidnap me, than to go through the unpleasantness of a kidnap. And similarly for a stationary bandit who wants to encourage business and a tax base within their territory, they'd also rather have the protection money than going through the unpleasantness of a kidnapping. So if everyone knows who to pay, how much to pay them and how to pay them, then there doesn't need to be any kidnapping. It's disequilibrium behavior. So if you, if, you, if you have good information, there doesn't need to be any kidnapping. So if people behave <laughs> in the right way, then you can ensure kidnap for ransom because it's not going to happen very often. If you give people access to the information. So this, uh, this organization, this sort of FARC, which is... Uh for contests like a, a, a sort of yeah it could be yeah. a rebel group it could be it could be a mafia <laughs> it could be a cartel it doesn't it doesn't really right. matter what what, mm. what 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 i need for the sort of equilibrium behavior so everyone knows who the don is and the don knows how much to charge <laughs> and uh and, and how to pay right so so they control a specific territory and you want to do business there and they want to charge you some tax. Uh, that that was another interesting part of the uh, the story. Just that uh, that the way people casually talked about it was in terms of a, a tax, right? Uh, and um, you know, it's only if you try to get out of it. Yeah, accounting, fines, taxes, very very much um, not the sort of chaotic portrayal of all this that. Uh, that you see see in media, but uh, but a very organized business. Exactly, but it was in the interest of the rebel group. To, uh, this company did their business and made the investment in the local economy, so they would not have gained very much from pushing the fine, <laughs> the ransom so high, as to make it impossible to make a profit. So it was very very finely judged. So you briefly mentioned um, the. Uh ransom insurance i think probably most people do not know that that exists but you know as an economist it makes sense that it would that you'd be insured against all hazards and this is one of them especially if it's a very sort of consistent thing as you've described how popular is that insurance how how does it work yeah right well the less the insured know about it the better in a way so it's very rare that people buy ransom, kidnap for ransom insurance for themselves. 
usually it's bought by the employer on behalf of the employee as part of their duty of care. The idea being that, um, A, you don't behave in a way that makes you likely to be kidnapped. And if you are kidnapped, you are then more likely to tell the kidnapper that you are fairly small fry, that uh, your employer has nothing to do with negotiating a ransom and that they should phone your family, which works extremely well in terms of managing the expectations of the kidnappers. So, so you get this, your employer gets this insurance and, and... And he's not allowed to tell you about it. Oh. This is held at a very high level. Okay, so so you don't yeah, know. You might even be told specifically that you are not insured. You don't know. As soon as you know, you're not insured anymore. Right, because uh, if you... Oh, so this, this, is, this is all about moral hazard. This is a classic insurance story that you behave differently if you are insured. So you must not know about it. Right, so... Some people might surmise that they... Quite very well be insured, but if you know, then you're no longer insured. That invalidates the contract. So you couldn't tell, you know, get kidnapped and say, oh, I'm insured, go talk to this insurance firm and, you know, they'll pay out the, the maximum yeah, amount. Exactly, exactly. Because you don't want people to say, I'm insured for a million, go and get it. So how does, how does it work then? How does the... Uh, how do the insurance companies uh, react once you do get kidnapped? Yeah, so what you have is uh, a crisis responder. I mean, I, sh I should go a few steps back. With a product comes security consulting, travel advice, safety advice, very hands-on management of the firm's security, especially if that firm operates in environments that are they term uh, complex and hostile, where it is likely that there are gangs operating, that the state is not strong enough to protect the firm, where you will need additional private protection, or uh, possibly informal. So plan A is that the customers don't get kidnapped. And that's exactly what we observe. You have all these firms that are operating in, in, in Mexico and in Mali and in Colombia, and it's hardly ever that there is a hostage incident. If there is a hostage incident, that's when plan B kicks in. And whoever ends up fielding the phone call from the kidnappers will then be coached and advised by a very experienced crisis responder whose job it is to make kidnapping both difficult or make, make the ransoming aspect of kidnapping Difficult, because you don't want opportunists to kidnap and get a lot of money, um, but also to engender a very strong ransom discipline so you don't have this effect where criminals think, wow, these guys got a million in an afternoon. Kidnapping is what I want to be in. And then you get a kidnapping boom and a kidnapping hotspot. So it's about making sure that the ransoms are low enough relative to the cost of staging the kidnap and negotiating the ransom, that kidnappers think we might as well drive a taxi. Right. Or smuggle drugs or whatever. <laughs> whatever other business venture is available to them. So the point is, it's not worthwhile doing. So, so the insurance company, sort of, they pool the risk of many people operating in these areas Yes. And, and they actively reduce the yes, risk as they well. They actively reduce it because they have that incentive because they're insuring many people. Uh, if they were to make a big payout, exactly. So, so the insurance is is conditional on best practice in 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 that particular locality. Yeah, and so you would have a security management, and uh, you're a. Your premium will strongly depend on implementing that plan. In, in the same way, you you know the, your insurer. If you want to get fire insurance, you have to remove, um, you know, flammable uh, objects from around your house, right? Uh, you you know you you need to take precautions. Exactly, and if you have a sprinkler system, then then you get a better premium, etc. Yeah. So it's it's it's, it's one one aspect is duty of care. Firms do want to be seen to take care of their employees, but 
the other thing is also economic incentives. Yeah. Is this insurable at all? And if so, is it insurable at a particular price? Yeah, so that that's so that's interesting. By by pooling together this risk, you create an entity with the the proper incentives to to mitigate it, to you know reduce the sort of global risk of uh, encouraging future kidnappers. And just an individual might not have that incentive. You know, you your family member is missing. Absolutely not. And yes. You 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 might want to just pay out as much as you can to ensure they get back. But, you know, that's not great for the next person who travels through that region and suddenly has um, emboldened kidnappers, more kidnappers. Yes, exactly right. And then you find that this pooling of risk is very tight because you have just a few, about 20 insurers who insure this and underwrite this at all. And they all sit in one building in Lime Street in London. So um, it sounds like the reason this industry is so orderly, despite being outside of formal legal mechanisms, is because of repeat interactions. Um, is, is that that's the, the sort of key point? That is exactly what it is. It's it's about creating a shadow of the future in which people can build reputations, and that's. Security consultants who build reputations for creating management plans that actually work. It's for kidnappers who build reputations for treating hostages reasonably and returning them after the ransom is paid. It's for crisis responders who build reputations for getting clean, swift, and cheap resolutions. And it's for all the various middlemen and ransom dropper offers, et cetera, who, who also need to build reputation. So you need an, a structure that allows fantastic information exchange, but also that's completely discreet. Again, you don't want to build a public database or use the media to, um, to build these reputations. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned uh, middlemen, and, and that's uh, a big part of your book uh, that it's just difficult to pay a ransom um you know that the people don't on the other end of it uh the kidnappers don't take credit cards you can't just uh you know paypal money to them <laughs> no. and you know once you've got a suitcase full of money and have have taken it to some location where you can give it to them you know there's no reason at, at that point for them to uh to well there one might think there was no reason for them to then hold up their end of the bargain. Yeah, I mean you you you've already sidelined quite a lot of difficulties and issues here. So mm. the first thing, how are you actually going to get a sack full of cash across an international border? Oh. Yeah, so you've raised the cash in London and uh say you want to put it on a plane in Nairobi to fly it over to Somalia. How are you actually going to get that sack of cash mm. into Nairobi airport <laughs> without being arrested at customs and having it confiscated and ending up the night in prison? So that in itself is a question. How is that money going to appear in the location mm. Without the police and the central bank and customs and everyone else knowing about it, so so you need a specialist who can appear magically appear money, uh, often significant amount significant amounts of money in in strange places, and then you have to find somebody who will drop it off at a place of the choosing of the kidnapper. And of course, that place would also be a place where it would be very easy for the kidnapper to then stage another kidnap. So how do you keep that person safe? How do they keep themselves safe? What assurances do you need from the kidnappers? And Didn't even think about crossing the border. <laughs> yes, there, there, there are so many issues. And, and, and again, you might have a middleman again. You might have somebody who says, okay, I've got a cafe. <laughs> Or I've got a shop, and uh, the kidnapper can come here and bring the hostage. 
and uh, the rudds are bearer can come and meet in my territory and I'll keep a safe, I'll keep this a safe place. So then you need a reputation for making that work. So it's, it's, it's hugely interesting. How, how do you actually structure that exchange so it's safe for both sides? And then, as you said, it's very likely to be a sequential exchange. So if you pay first, then you're <laughs> likely that uh, the kidnapper will at least think, well, have we really got everything that we could possibly have squeezed out of this? Do we really want to release a potential future witness? Uh, so how do you deal with, 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 with that kind of problem, <laughs> given that there is no enforcement other than through a reputation that says, well, if you don't give your hostage back this time, then next time we're not even going to go down the route of negotiating a ransom with you. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, you know, and you mentioned off the top that somehow uh, most of most of the time, all of these steps do end up going well and the hostage ends up being returned. So so the you know, people have found ways to do all of these things to, you know, get the money where it needs to be and to make the exchange and to to actually get the the person back uh, after they've handed over the the money in the sequential exchange, and yeah, it's just uh, it's kind of amazing. Um, you do have a chapter on uh, you know when things go wrong and why hostages die. Um, uh, so for the small portion of of people who who don't make it back, uh, you know what what usually has has gone wrong. What kind of things? Uh, lead to to the bad outcome. Right. So the system that I've described here is very specifically for insured kidnap for ransom. So this is about people who work for firms that have bought insurance for them, who only find out afterwards that that is the case, who are the beneficiaries and recipients of all these services created by insurers to make this product work. I mean, kidnap for ransom insurance would not be something that firms would be interested in if only 50% of hostages came back alive. That, that just would not work. So there is a system, but of course, not everybody who is kidnapped for ransom is insured. So they may not have access to that system, or if they are aware that there is professional help, they're probably not going to get the best people to help them because just pulling all that information together is, is, is difficult for a, for, 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 for a family. But the hostage incidents that I'm particularly worried about are the ones that are uninsurable by law because the United Nations has banned ransom payments to organizations that are considered to be terrorists. So there is a list of terrorist organizations and um, it is illegal to facilitate a ransom payment towards these organizations, which means that insurers cannot facilitate a ransom payment. So... <laughs> That sidelines all of that private order regime that normally resolves these incidents. So most of the cases that I look at in this when hostage incidents go wrong, when hostages die, are about terrorists kidnapped for ransom, where the counterparty is, is not a calm specialist who's already dealt with dozens if not a hundred of these cases you've got a nervous bureaucrat at the end of the phone line whose government has said yes we're aware that um, there is international law that prevents us from making a ransom but we're going to do it anyway we're going to rescue our citizens so it's just a stance taken by, 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 by the French government and the Italian government and the Spanish government and the German government and the Swiss government so they're making decisions in a completely different framework. The, the bureaucrat is not worried about his reputation as somebody who delivers cheap resolutions. Yeah? In fact, it's 
going to be extremely difficult for them to demonstrate any kind of budget constraint in a negotiation. They also are under a lot of pressure to do something quickly and uh, to prevent harm coming to their hostages. And then they're going to be very nervous when it comes to threats of torture, which the insurance guys have learned to ignore because that protects the hostage. Mm, just a, a reputation of ignoring it is what protects them. I, it's, 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 I think it's one of those misconceptions about hostage negotiation that you can throw money at the problem and it will go away. But if you reason through it in a rational choice framework, then you see that this is not an equilibrium strategy anyway. So if, if I find an extra 100,000 every time somebody put the gun to my beloved's head, then there's going to be a lot of guns being pointed at his head, aren't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, and yeah, that's something you emphasize. The game, <laughs> the negotiation is only going to st stop when I can demonstrate that I've run out of resources. Yeah, so, so the, the kidnappers... If you can, if if, mm. if you can always squeeze out more from me, and significantly more from me every time you do something horrible, then you continue doing horrible. Yeah, the, things. the kidnappers are playing this game of trying to well, well not to, you, um, but a kidnapper would uh, assess your your net worth or you know how much you can pay, and so you, exactly. So the the, the yeah. process is called squeezing the towel dry. Yeah, so they squeeze and they squeeze and they squeeze harder and, and until the drips that come out of that towel are not worth their while in terms of the cost of keeping the hostage. So <laughs> the more money you throw at the problem, the longer they keep squeezing until eventually they get to the point where you run out of resources. Yeah, and I mean, that was present in your Colombian anecdote uh, before where they, they had the rebel group hired someone to look up the financial situation of, you know, the businesses operating in the region. Exactly. It's much more, much closer to a full information equilibrium. Yes. They pitched it exactly right. Yeah. But they knew everything about his company. They knew everything about him and they, they'd got that right. But if, if you pick up a tourist, a tipsy tourist from, from, from a bar and, downtown, wherever, you don't have that information. And that's when the squeezing thing might come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Depending on how much time the kidnappers have. You know? So if, if, if somebody's negotiating a ransom from the back of a car, then they probably don't have three or four months to fully find out what resources they are. And they're probably going to be happy. Or not happy. And they're going to release by the end of the day anyway, because they need to get out of that car. Yeah, and and so the quicker you you can get money to them, the more money you can get to them in that initial squeeze of the towel, the more they're going to be sort of adjusting their you know their belief in uh, your your ability to to pay more. Yeah, here we've got a VIP with a lot of money. Let's keep squeezing. Let's do whatever it takes to create circumstances in which we can fully investigate how much money that family mm -hmm. really has yes and often you find resale of hostages if you out yourself as a vip by immediately offering whatever figure first came into the kidnapper's head then you're in for the long haul whereas if you prevaricate and, and, and say well i haven't got anything and you're making me extremely nervous mm -hmm. and i can't I can't engage in a conversation with you about a ransom as long as my beloved is in complete distress, then they will stop in that behavior. So, so it's about sending extremely consistent signals of saying, well, if you do this, then, then, then we're, not going to, we're not even going to talk about ransoms. And you're certainly not going to get an increment. Yeah, so there, it sounds like there's a very consistent set of best practices which which one would expect from it is and they're based they're based on rational choice and on on acting against your gut instinct but it is better for the hostage 
And that's why you need the support. That's why you need the expert support. I mean, I can talk about this, but if it's someone I care about on the other end of the phone being maltreated, I, I certainly need the expert in the room to possibly literally hold my hand and help me stay firm. Do, do you think, um, so returning to the UN's um, prohibition on making you know hostage payments to um, terrorist organizations, it's it's clear that the goal of that is to not fund those organizations and also to potentially disincentivize them from taking hostages. Do you think the rule actually succeeds in reducing the the amount of hostages taken by those organizations? Yeah, I have I have no quibbles at all about the mm-hmm. intentions of this ban. The problem is, from a political point of view, that almost everyone agrees that it's a bad thing to give money to terrorists, and almost everybody would do whatever it takes to get their loved one back. So it's impossible to have a policy that gets it right for everybody. <laughs> Because people are themselves conflicted. People understand that families will do anything to get their loved ones back. So the problem that I see with this ban is that it puts governments in charge of the decision about what will be done to help the hostages. And bureaucrats, without budget constraints, with a possibility of the, uh, the, the, the opposition not just demanding money, but policy changes and prisoner exchanges, etc. They're in a very, very poor position to demonstrate that they've reached their limits, but it tends to take a long time. Right. So, um, so and it's possible th- then... And, and they just don't have any incentives <laughs> to minimize the ransom payment. Mm. And moreover, you then have the problem that There are some nations that stick to the line or largely stick to the line that they're not going to negotiate. And therefore, so the idea is a US citizen will not be ransomed or a UK citizen will not be ransomed, a Canadian citizen will not be ransomed, that should deprive them of all value and therefore should not be worth kidnapping them. So so there would be an idea there that it should make other nationalities more attractive and divert kidnapping towards them, if anything. But the problem is that because of the way that bureaucrats negotiate, um, the Canadian citizen and the US citizen and the UK citizen has massive value because by maltreating them badly and killing them horribly, you make the French, the Spanish and the Italian negotiators so nervous that they double the ransom on their citizens. and. That is just counterproductive. It doesn't serve anybody. They're a terrorist organization because they do terror, right? Yes, but they are also surprisingly rational entrepreneurs. And they do sell off hostages. <laughs> they, yeah, they, they, they have a different kind of reputation to maintain. Yes, yes. Which is served by not treating the hostages well. However, so what, what, what I was particularly interested in. You, you, you could say, okay, here we have criminal kidnap for ransom and there we've got political kidnap for ransom and they're completely different beasts and you shan't compare apples with pears. I like having a comparative scenario. So what, 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 what I do in that chapter is to say, well, how do governments fare when they're against criminal opposition? Because sometimes governments get involved. And they decide that they're going to intervene on behalf of their citizens, even though it should be a private matter. And interestingly, they end up paying ransoms that are an order of magnitude at least higher than the private sector would have done. And they get their citizens out slightly faster, but only marginally faster. And they set up incentives for the same thing to happen over and over again. The second transition that I'm looking at is what happens if you have a, a criminal group that bumbles along in the, in the criminal equilibrium and then affiliates with Al-Qaeda or ISIS 
and suddenly becomes a terrorist organization simply by that step. So I've got the case of, of, of Abu Sayyaf, which bumbles along at around 100,000 laboriously over, negotiated laboriously over months. But basically people come back out from, 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 from Abu Sayyaf. Then they get put into the ca- terrorist category by affiliation. And the very next ransom is 5.6 million from 100,000 previously. Yeah? So you can't say that within this month <laughs> the, the organization has changed entirely. The, the, the problem is that the counterparty has changed. Rather than having an experienced crisis negotiator there, you've got a civil servant who's working under completely different incentive structure and without that that experience and that that network and 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 then you you've also got the problem that 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 governments just don't know the right middleman and they just choose somebody who may or may not have a bearing on the case at all and who may or may not abscond with the ransom or large parts of the ransom they don't know how would they know They, they just do not have access to this infrastructure that makes the ransom drop and, 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 the, and the hostage retrieval work as well. So <laughs> you can see why I'm really worried. And it's, it's, it's a bit like saying, okay, we, we, we're going to do cardiac surgeons. We, we, we want to put in charge of most uh, operations. Uh, however, when it's open heart surgery, we're going to get the people from the tattoo parlor because they're going to do fine. They just don't have the experience. They don't have the training. Yeah, oh man. And, and, and that makes that policy, that policy counterproductive. So th- there's a big payoff in this one regard to becoming, uh, getting labeled as a terrorist organization, which was not something I was expecting at all. Indeed. And, and, and you find that in, in general, governments are aware of that. So, for, 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 for example, with Somali piracy, uh, there was, was mounting evidence that uh, pirates were sharing proceeds um, with the Al-Shabaab terror group. And uh, the UK government put a task force uh, onto the job to decide um, whether uh, piracy was a terrorist activity or, or, or a criminal activity. And um, the, uh, the shipping industry was just very, very strongly lobbying, saying, well, we want our ships back and we want our crews back and we want our cargo untouched. And if you start putting this down the terrorist stream, uh, all bets are off. Mm. So whatever you do, please do not label this a terrorist activity because it's just going to be so much worse. And and indeed, the pragmatic approach was that the task force found that it was essentially a criminal activity. Yeah, um, it's a a lot of surprising things. (laughs) It's it's just sometimes, uh, with with, with, with Abu Sayyaf, yes, of course, they've always been a political organization, but until they decided to affiliate with a global international terrorist organization. You could ignore that for the benefit of, 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 of keeping a, a low ransom equilibrium where people come home alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's um, very concerning. And it kind of, uh, I guess, plays into my sort of priors about, uh, about you know, the unexpected consequences of policies. They don't always do exactly what uh, what you expect them to you think you you can ban uh negotiating and and that that'll uh remove the incentive to take hostages but then you just push it underground you know it becomes a uh it still happens it just doesn't happen through the formal channels that uh that actually serve a lot of good purposes yes i mean you might you might also have for a, a change in people's behavior. So if you know that an American or, or a UK passport is a death warrant, then you won't go to certain areas. And then you think, well, is that really in the national interest that 
British and American people can no longer research or report or invest or deliver aid. Do you really want to create the large, wide areas of the map? Because you know that NGOs and firms are passport sensitive in their programming. And they're just not going to send people with the wrong passport oh. into these areas. They can't get their can't get their people back. Yeah. So, if people say, "Okay, but it has worked because there haven't been any American hostages here, there, and everywhere," you can say, "Yes, but there's been some cost associated with that as well." And do you really want to leave Africa to to to, to China? Right. Maybe that is considered to be the national interest, but maybe not. But we just need to think about what we really want and what, what the priorities are. Yeah, so the, there's the incentive on the other side to just not in, not uh, go places where you could get kidnapped. Yeah, and uh, and then people are potentially losing out on a lot of value for, you know, being barred from, from those areas effectively by, by this risk. Indeed, yes. I mean, it's it, it's it's about it's about influence and, and 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 power as well, isn't it? If you just create white areas of the map where your citizens can't go, because not not because the idea of the policy is wrong. What, what what's wrong about it is that it's not enforced for everyone. Yeah, that 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 some nations decide that they're going to rescue their people by negotiating massive ransoms for them. And some states don't. So if, if it was universally accepted and enforced, then the policy would work. And, and that, that was exactly the point of making it a UN policy. Right. We're finding that, unfortunately, the UN does not uh, have the power to, to enforce, you know, to make all the nations do things. Does not have the power to enforce. Whereas, by contrast, <laughs> the Lloyd system does have the power to enforce on its members the ransom discipline that the market as a whole needs. Yeah, so I've, I've been... Lloyd's is the, the private group. The private sector kidnapped for ransom insurance. Yeah, so they work as a club, and that means that they are extremely aware of the spillovers that a massive ransom generates in the way that the Swiss government doesn't care about because they're thinking... We just want our citizens back. And hopefully the next incident is going to be an Italian or a Spanish or a Belgian. You know, so they don't care about the implications of paying a massive ransom to get one of their mm. nationals back home. But within the kidnap for ransom world, the kidnap for ransom insurers, A, they are all more exposed, but also they work as a club. And if there is a club member that doesn't play by the rules, that does that goes in and pays too much to get people out a little bit earlier, then they can kick them out of the club. So it's a fantastic example of of club governance. It would be impossible to make a contract between insurers about premium ransoms not being paid. But with a club where the membership has to be renewed on an annual basis and can be revoked without definitive proof of wrongdoing, but just the suspicion that somebody is not playing the game right, then you suddenly have a credible threat. And the UN just doesn't have that. Not, not, not even the G5 have been able to agree on this. So <laughs> never mind the rest of the UN. Mm. Okay, so um, we're we're running, we're getting close to the end of our time. Uh, do you have any sort of closing thoughts? Any sort, any general takeaways that uh, that listeners should take from this conversation? Well, of course, everyone should read my book. But <laughs> yes, I think I found particularly exciting about this research area was that there is this thing of beauty. This governance system that makes the impossible possible on a regular basis. And I've interviewed many, many people about this, and none of them were completely aware of the system. They were all saying, oh, well, I'm just a problem solver. I'm just an expert on 
making money up here in Nairobi or I'm just good at getting a, a low <laughs> ransom or just really good at reassuring family members or all I do is uh, monitor the, 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 the political situation and the local security situation on a street-by-street -street basis in Mali. That's what I'm good at. So you could get hundreds of experts making small bits of this system work, but not really zooming out and, and, and understanding it as a system. So it's, it's taught me a lot about, about private, polycentric governance and how these structures can come into existence and there are layers and layers of, of, of expertise bolted on and added on as, uh, as problems become apparent and you know you need someone to resolve them. So you, you end up with a very intricate system and yet the people who've caused it to be didn't even know about it. And I found that, that fascinating as in hidden in, in, in plain view. And yeah, um, a re really good example of something that's the, the result of human action but not of human design. Yes, hum human ingenuity at every corner of it, and and with with a hostage at its heart. But yeah, you know, also finding that that it's irrational choices that that, that ultimately protect the uh, hostages' interests, and and and, and not the well-meaning emotional responses uh, that come to the fore in 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 this kind of context. It's by rational action that. Uh, that, that, that we can help people in, in, in this context, whereas the kidnappers are going to try absolutely everything to force us down that emotional route. Mm, yeah. Um, well, on that, that note, we can uh, we'll close the episode. My guest today has been Anya Shortland. Anya, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Well, thank you for your brilliant questions. Talk to you again. Yeah. And, and just for the audience, uh, I'll give you a quick reminder the book is called kidnap inside the ransom business and i'll link to it at the show notes page at economicsdetective.com thanks again anya and um i'll be back next week <laughs>